China, can we rely on the Supreme Court? Oh, big question. This is uh, Think Tech Hawaii. It's the 11 o'clock block on a given Monday. And we have Peter Hoffenberg, a co-host co and a contributor. And we have Avi Soifer, a regular contributor and guest here on History is Here to Help, because we need help. Welcome to the show, you guys. Thank you. Aloha. Good to be here. OK, Peter, at the risk of giving you too much time. Of course. I have a little could, clock watch here. Could you please introduce Avi and be nice? And I, could you also introduce the scope of our discussion this I'm morning? Always, I'm always nice and following Hemingway. No adjectives and no adverbs. Be very precise. Anyhow, good to have you back, Avi. I think probably everybody knows you, but just in case you don't, and they don't, uh, Avi Soifer is the former dean of the William Richardson School of Law here and pushed it into the top 100, Mazel Tov. Uh, and it's also a, a very well recognized and respected con law scholar uh, with publications here, there, and everywhere. So Jay and I have asked him to talk about, since we only have 30 minutes, try to have some very specific topics about the Supreme Court. And Jay and I wanted Avi in particular to talk about uh, not just the workings of the court, but what he thought the current public status might do to this institution. The most recent Pew report had the uh, Supreme Court just plummet in public accountability. So let me turn it over uh, to Avi and Jay. Uh, is that okay, Jay? Was that brief enough? Uh, let me, yeah, that's good. Let me, uh, let me give you the notes that I made while I thought about this all weekend. Uh, first of all, uh, was it uh, Aaron, Aaron uh, in the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU, you know NYU, you were teaching in there on sabbatical only last year. The, uh, the court get, get an F, which I thought was uh, interesting. Um, and then, you know, it, it shifted to the right, but, you know, isn't that okay? That's another question. And um, haven't we had this, this is my question to you, both of you, haven't we had this in the past? Why is this different? You know, it's like the Passover. Why is this shift to the right different from all the other shifts to the right? And how did we get here over 50 years? You know, Adam Cohn in his book writes about that. There are, there are two books to uh, consider. You know, one is Adam Cohn, 2020, uh, Supreme Injustice, and the other is Linda Greenhouse, who I, I have to acknowledge is my sister-in-law. And she wrote Justice on the Brink only recently and this year. Um, and so, um, you know, are we moving to a place that's worse? Are we already there? And Avi, where is it going? What's the dynamic that we can take from their questions in these cases on all these sensitive and highly politicized issues. Wow, sorry. Is that compound complex? Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll be, what are you doing in the next two weeks? Are you okay? <laughs> You'll get some food and drink? Well, Jay, I'm, I'm sure she's proud to uh, acknowledge that you are her brother-in-law. So there we are. You have, you have a lot to be proud of. Linda, she's terrific. And she writes columns for the New York Times. She used to cover the court uh, for a long time. And she's got a new book out, which is part of today's subject. But uh, she really is a wonderfully knowledgeable and outspoken uh, critic of the court, even though she knows them all and she knows the inner workings probably better than anybody. Well, she's more outspoken these days than she ever was in 30 years in the past. I mean, how about the articles? Uh, I mean, you're familiar with all of them. Um, uh, weaponizing, the, the court is weaponizing, gaslighting. gaslighting. Yeah. Um, and the court is, uh, oh, I guess this refers to the Fifth Circuit, my favorite circuit. Uh, it's, um, what, did, what did she call the Fifth Circuit? Rogue. Rogue. I mean, and other adjectives. These are uh, outspoken words, maybe more than ever before. Well, Justice Sotomayor is very careful. She is uh, very committed to, I think, some very important things. Uh, but she talked about the stench. I mean, for a Supreme Court justice to talk about the stench emanating from that body is really quite something. And there is a stench. I think there's no question about that. And part of it is because they're not playing by the usual rules and they don't seem to care about the usual rules. Uh, so yes, we have had right-wing courts, in fact, for most of our history, I would say. Uh, so that's happened before. Uh, but the aggressive way in which they are trying to advance an agenda, which they're very clear about, and using things like the shadow docket, uh, which has always, not always been there, I guess, but has been there for a long, long time, uh, but suddenly it's being used and abused in a way it never has before. And the shadow docket means they don't have to hear oral argument. There isn't a public attention to what's going on. They do it without briefs. They do it without oral argument. And they just decide something. And they just decide, well, this is an emergency. And what they think of as an emergency might be 
uh, pandemic rules, which they believe, the majority of the court believe, uh, interfered with free exercise of religion. But they don't think what's going on in Texas right now with abortion is an emergency. So I think the public is paying more attention to the court than for a long, long time. That may be a good thing in, in the long run, but they're paying attention with uh, holding their noses. And I think that is actually uh, unusual, if not unprecedented. All, all that considered, you know, the public can't do much about it. And I think what, what shows in these last few arguments and what they're doing on CERT is they're picking um, the Trump issues, they're picking right-wing issues, and they don't care what we think. They well, don't, they, I don't know if that's arrogance or what. They've driven even Chief Justice Roberts uh, far from where they were and probably where he was because he, they don't seem concerned about the institution. The court is an institution, and he suddenly is siding fairly frequently with the so-called liberal justices, and they've, Gorsuch in particular has been going after Roberts in a pretty personal way for not being part of the team. Well, but, you know, uh, uh, was it Roberts who said that we, the most important thing is we have to preserve the institution? They're not preserving the institution. They're undermining the institution. It's not just public confidence. It's, it's a rational analysis of what they're doing and that gaslighting thing. And it seems to me that no one can ever trust them again. Well, I wouldn't go that far. Let's hope. One, one can be optimistic ever, ever, Jay? I, I knew I'd run into some optimism around here somewhere. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it is true that the, the justices who are leading, and we don't know about Justice Barrett much yet. Uh, so there's a little bit of a shred maybe of hope there that she may, now that she has this appointment for life, uh, turn out to be a surprise in some ways. I don't expect big surprises. Uh, but the justices who are leading this, including Justice Barrett, are very young. Uh, so they will be there for a long, long time. Well, I'm sure you can give me examples of justices over the, the years of the Republic who, who started out mm, conservative, who started out mm, destructive, negative, and advancing the, the, uh, their, the, the president who appointed them, his, his agenda or her agenda, well, it hasn't been her. Well, but, I, uh, I but, certainly... but this time, a query whether that's going to happen. Well, so those are usually surprises, so we don't know if it's going to happen. But uh, I think that some of the recent surprises were Harry Blackman, for sure, Justice Souter more quietly. Uh, on the other side, Frankfurter was regarded as a radical, and then he became probably the most conservative member of the Warren Court. So there are surprises, and there's something to the fact that it's collegial. Uh, sometimes they listen to each other, uh, and it may be that. Uh, Roberts is effective as a leader of a collegial body. We'll see. Um, but Barrett has been noteworthy for not being part of the Alito, Gorsuch, and to some extent Kavanaugh team so far. In all cases, she is certainly sometimes. And I think what's really um, telling but also dangerous is a lot of these things are done um, in ways that the public doesn't quite understand, like the shadow docket. Um, we ought to be paying attention, and at least there's some coverage to an oral argument, and the public presumably not uh, following line by line, but they learn something about what went on today or yesterday at the Supreme Court. And when they're doing this, the public doesn't know. You think the uh, press is uh, giving us good reporting on what the court is doing and not doing? Not as good as when Linda Greenhouse was doing it. <laughs> Well, you know, there's two books out. I, I suggest to you, this is a constitutional lawyer's delight right now. This is, this is what justifies uh, all the difficulty of learning constitutional law to be able to comment on it now. And, and uh, I am hoping that the public will get the same, you know, level of interest. Um, I'm not sure that's going to happen, though, because uh, it's complicated. Well, so I... Adam Liptak is doing a good job, I think, for the Times. I didn't mean to say he wasn't. And, uh, and Anthony Lewis was a very good reporter covering the court for a long time. Uh, one of the issues, and it's a big issue in our time, is that there is a lot more information out there. So there are other people covering the court. It isn't just three channels on TV and the New York Times and the Washington Post. And so you can kind of find whatever you want as a member of the public. And that can be on your side, and you don't have to listen to the other side. So I think that uh, playing it right down the middle of being careful is very important in reporting and remains so. But the reporting now is much more disparate. Um, so what does the public think of the court? 
we know from some polling results that the court has gone down in its prestige recently. It has gone down in its prestige before, by the way, uh, including one of the famous issues with the court was when they were striking down much of the New Deal. And that became a hot potato, a political issue. And FDR decided to try to pack the court. And that turned out, even for a brilliant politician such as Franklin Delano Roosevelt clearly was, to be a disaster. It turned out that the public wouldn't stand for it. Now, neither would some insiders, including Felix Frankfurter, who had been an ally. Um, but it's a, it's a third rail, I think, to pack the court. So one of the proposals that's kicking around is to add justices. The problem with that is it has been done in the past, both shrinking and expanding the membership. It doesn't have to be nine. It's not in the Constitution. But once you do it, then if your team loses in the next election, then they do it and so on. And then the court loses even more prestige. I think term limits is a much more sensible proposal and it is being taken somewhat seriously. Although this commission uh, that President Biden set up, I don't know exactly what it was supposed to do except perhaps reduce the pressure on President Biden, but it sounds like they're not gonna do anything much. They were more open to term limits than they were to court packing apparently. Is the commission bipartisan? Yeah. Uh, that, that explains it. <laughs> if you're looking for delay, you know, try bipartisan. Uh, anyway, uh, so you know, there are some issues we should talk about and where they're going and what and what effect they have on all this what you're describing. Um, you know, for example, abortion. It seems clear that abortion's going away, that uh, women's reproductive rights are going away. When when they get their hands on it, it's all finished. And uh, Amy Barrett will be at the center of that. I think Kavanaugh will be too. Um, and so the question I put to you, Avi, is uh, how does that affect public opinion? Because remember, well, think, the half the country is right wing here. Well, I think actually abortion is a very interesting example of several things. First of all, Roe versus Wade was really changed, even though it survived. It has become much harder to get an abortion than it was. Now, there's a famous incident when the court and Scalia in particular thought they were going to overrule it, and they didn't. And they stressed the importance of stare decisis of precedent. And that's important now as they're overruling all these precedents. Uh, and that was a big surprise to Scalia. A very angry Scalia was seen yelling at Justice Kennedy on his lawn one Saturday. Uh, so Roe has been eviscerated. Uh, and the undue burden test is of course a very subjective test, and that's where we are now. I think- Well, let them all just go and give up the child at the local fire station or, or police station. But doesn't that, that take the Justice, burden off- Justice Barrett had to, had to say. Uh, so uh, th there is something to what Jay just suggested, in, in her opinion, at least. Um, so I think, I have a bet with someone who does constitutional law that they will not overrule Roe versus Wade, because I think if they did, that would affect voter turnout very significantly. So I think they will continue to narrow, 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 but not on its face overrule Roe versus Wade. Are you suggesting the members of our esteemed Supreme Court would care about voter turnout? Isn't that highly political? Mr. Dooley, way back at the time of uh, imperialism and the insular cases and what to do about the territory of Hawaii, talked about how the Supreme Court follows the election returns. He did it with his fake Irish uh, dialogue. And We've got to get them to follow Think Tech Hawaii. You know? um, okay, so <laughs> so the the thing about um, you know uh, abortion is um, you know, I wanted to ask you you know uh, I think Linda Greenhouse you know, was talking about disingenuous gaslighting statements by the Supreme Court, and one of the most interesting examples of that, uh, which I don't fully understand, maybe you do. She said that uh, Kavanaugh in his questioning. Uh, pointed out that uh, there have been many cases over the years where the Supreme Court has reversed a holding years, a right even even uh, of years and years, um, you know, um, you know, uh, years and years in place. Um, and so the question is, why is that disingenuous? There have been a lot of cases where the Supreme Court has reversed itself. Why can't it do that in Rome? Well, the Supreme Court has reversed itself lots of times, and sometimes to the good. It should be said. Uh, the Supreme Court was complicit in racial discrimination for a long, long time. They were complicit in many other things. The famous case that I think is worth it, at least uh, maybe as a corrective, is uh, Frankfurter opinion, uh, 
uh, called Gobitis, which said, okay, you know, the citizenship is very important. This is uh, 1940, 41. Uh, so understandable that he thought citizenship was very important, patriotism. And so we can mandate that school kids have to salute the flag. And it was sort of a fascist salute. It was a straight arm salute. And Jehovah's Witnesses said that interferes with our rights as parents and the rights of our children. And the Supreme Court said, tough luck. Patriotism is that important. So that three and a half years later, four years later, the Supreme Court reversed that. And it's brilliant language written by Justice Jackson for the court about how important the First Amendment is. And we can't be forcing beliefs on people. And that's 1944. Uh, so the war was still going on. So that's a reversal that we can applaud. So I don't think we should say never reverse or always follow precedent, because overall, the precedents are bad uh, in many areas. And the Warren Court was the exception. And some of us who went to law school or went to college or grew up with the Warren Court, I think, have a falsely optimistic view of the court and what it is about. So there are rights and there are rights. Uh, to, to not uh, exactly respond to your question. One of the differences now, though, is that some of the justices have been signaling, oh, we want a case. Please send us a case. We want to overrule this precedent. And overruling ought to be done in gingerly fashion when it's done and carefully. And one thinks about the role of precedent, uh, because the rule of law does rely on precedent, at least in our uh, country for a long time. Now, precedent is a break on what people may want to do right now. So precedent isn't all good and all bad. Um, but at least you should take seriously changing the law from the top when they do have the final word, not because they're right, but because they're final. As brand <laughs> Not because they're right, but because they're final. Uh, you know, you mentioned First Amendment, and that's really my next question to you. Um, you know, one of the suggestions here is that court uh, and perhaps uh, the GOP itself has moved, uh, not perhaps for real, the GOP has moved into religion. And the First Amendment has two provisions. So one is you, you should not have the government establish a religion. And the other is you should not stand in the way of freedom of religion. Um, and that's getting all confused now. Only in the past 20 years or so, at least according to my growing up with the Constitution, uh, my limited growing up with the Constitution, you know, we have turned into uh, legally a country that, that puts religion on a very high pedestal, um, higher than the First Amendment really uh, intended, I'm sure. Um, but we, were, we are now pushing it further. And if you ask for some justification, you know, about uh, Ro the Roe v. Wade direction here, it's got to be in large part religion. Is this good? Well, I think we should bring Peter into the conversation because we think in the United States that it's very important not to have an established religion. But Peter's an expert about England and English history, and we consider them hmm, mildly civilized, at least, and they have an established church. What do you know? Yeah. Uh, but, I do, but I do think that the Establishment Clause has been very important and that this court doesn't care about the Establishment Clause. So there's tension between those two, as, as you just said, Jay. I'm pleased that you think you're, you're grown up now, because some of us have questions about your growing up, but, uh, but there we are. Um, they were regarded as intention, and it's been a sort of sneaky way the court has done it, which is to say, we're gonna treat religion the same as we treat other First Amendment speakers and, act and actors, and look, they're excluded from the public square. Now, whether religion really is or isn't in this country is another question. I don't think they're excluded, but the, the way the line goes is we've got to just let them in equally. And it turns out that they are more equal than others. And the Establishment Clause has kind of just uh, disappeared almost in this analysis. Peter. Yeah, Peter, Peter, you're, you're civilized. I know you are. Terribly, uh, only for this half hour or so. <laughs> so a couple of comments. First of all, of course, Avi, thank you very, very much. Um, I would say, uh, Jay, to your, your big question, um, is that, look, it has been weaponized before. The court has been a weapon before. But I think one person put the response to Kavanaugh quite clearly, and, and Abby, you can correct me. Uh, in the past, the, particularly the cases he was referring to, was a matter of a precedent that had denied rights being overthrown so a new decision could expand rights. And it seems to me what we have here is particularly in the abortion case, uh, the theological uh, decision that uh, a uterus has the same rights 
as a woman. And so the argument is that they too are expanding rights, where of course they are not. I think uh, in that case, in response to your, your question about religion, uh, it is clearly, clearly guiding these folks. And I think people like uh, Alito have made uh, no qualms about it. And the recent appointee may be very, very strongly in what they have misnamed the right to life. And it's not really a scientific definition. I think, again, Avi, you can help us here. Maybe the court made a mistake by uh, having viability as the determining line. Because with science, right, viability can change. And Roe v. Wade never, right, absolutely said a woman has the absolute right to an abortion. Maybe you can correct me, but looking back historically, it seems that uh, the viability question opened up, right? So now you have uh, the scientific ability to hear the heart. And in public opinion, right, that shifts towards a, a, a life itself. So uh, does Jay, does that help answer? So I, yeah, but I, I just want to uh, uh, put one other thing on the table. Is the Supreme Court either has considered or is considering um, the equal uh, right to religion to give the same amount of money to parochial schools right that it gives to public schools. Now that is really upside down as far as I can see. Um, they're saying, I think it was uh, Kavanaugh that said, well, uh, you know, I, we shouldn't give more money to one religion than another, but then we shouldn't give more money to public schools than private schools. And before you know it, public, public schools are cut out. Um, this, is, this is troubling because A, it reinforces the whole notion, Supreme Court, and its constituency, can I use that term, is driven by religion. Uh, it's not just Roe v. Wade, it's the whole enchilada. Avi, am I right? I think it's more than religion, though. I, and I think that uh, Owen's book makes this quite clear. It, this is not just a religious issue. This is also a class and race issue. Because by promoting private schools, you're generally promoting, first of all, the more well-off, including religion, and basically, this is an attempt to uh, bifurcate the education system. So I agree with you, it's religion. But behind religion, I think Cohen is very important here. This has been a 50-year strategy. So I would disagree with you a little bit, Jay, in that, to me, Trump is just the poster child. This has been a 50-year strategy of the Federalist Society. It's been a 50-year strategy of the right and conservative in America to deny rights and access to people of color. It's been an effort to ensure that employers' rights are supreme over workers. And here's where I'll be, I, I don't think that Roberts is a neutral umpire. Roberts' career has been anti-voting rights and it has been entirely pro-business versus labor. And I think one of the difficulties is we, we focus on hot button issues, which we should, right? But in doing so, I think we've also ignored a lot of the smaller cases, which over the past generation or two have ensured, it's not just voting rights, right? It's uh, African Americans access to work. It's African Americans access to decent education, right? It's not just voting rights. It's women's access to education. It's women's access to work, not just women's access to birth control. And so to me, I look at this six to three, and, I, and to me, it looks like the 50-year war is, is over. And that's the difference I see. And we had talked about this before. Six to three is not five to four. Like Roberts can look good, right? Roberts can actually join the other three, but what he really wants can still win five, four, right? When it was, when it was closer five, four, you know, he had to have compromise. And I think that's what's gonna be missing. Um, the ability to have some kind of compromise. Now, the final point just briefly is the uh, US has taken the choice which is not Britain's and not France's. And so we're in a muddle. We've been in a muddle for over 200 years. The French Revolution did not just secularize the state, it secularized society. America has never been a secular society. Religion has always been part of public life. And in Britain, Britain took the Plessy v. Ferguson option and funded private religious schools and just said up front, we'll fund private religious schools. So we've been wandering in some link for 200 years because we haven't chosen either of those two straightforward, rather reasonable paths. 
Um, we do not have a secular society. We have a high religion. Have, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, and certainly Peter underscores important points which are lost, I think, on the general public. And that is the way in which the court has been a friend of business, I would say, over time as well as recently. And Roberts is certainly uh, where, where you put him, Peter. Although I want to go back to the question that, that Jay asked, I guess, and that is about uh, the expansion of, of rights and what Peter has just stressed. And that is sometimes the expansion of rights can be put at the doorstep of the current and the recent court. And one very good example and very troublesome example is the Second Amendment, uh, the right of individuals uh, to have guns. And for a long, long time, the Supreme Court said no to that claim over and over again. So they overruled precedent to expand rights. If you think there is something in the Second Amendment uh, for individual rights, there really isn't. And the way Scalia, so-called textualist, self-proclaimed, although he said he wasn't crazy, but he says that the Second Amendment naturally has two clauses, which allows him to talk about the second one and not the first, which is about the militia, which is what the right really historically was about for the most part. Uh, and then the court, interestingly, didn't touch it again, except to say it applies to states in the McDonald case. So 2008 is the Heller decision where Scalia does that. About six years later, McDonald, okay, that part of the Bill of Rights applies to the states, fine. But there were all sorts of rules and regulations passed by cities and passed by states regulating this new individual right. Well, now we may learn that they're unconstitutional, that the second, because that case is before the court right now, and it's very scary because it looks very likely that they're going to say, oh, those rules and regulations, they go too far. There's a right to carry. There's a right to hide your gun while you carry. We're going to, we're going to learn a lot more about that. And it isn't historically in the text, and it isn't historically uh, what the court has been saying. So sometimes creating or discovering rights can be uh, dangerous, too. So part of my optimism and I get kidded about being an optimist by both of these two. Uh, there's, a line, there's a line in Faulkner somewhere where he says, whoever wins, it won't be for good and it won't be for long. And I think that's one, one of the other things we see about the court. As I said, they're young justices, but who knows? Who knows? Uh, what happened with uh, FDR and the court was well, suddenly there were deaths and resignations and he got to remake the court. And so the Supreme Court stopped being the enemy of the New Deal uh, famously in 1937, having struck down uh, four or five years worth of whatever they could reach. So should Stephen Breyer retire? Because if he retires, it's going to be very hard for Joe Biden to replace him with a Democrat um, before you know, the next election. And the, and the Republicans will, will delay that as much as they can. Should he retire? Do you know how the next election is going to come out, Jay? Maybe there'll um, be a solid Democratic majority in the Senate. I may not know, but I'm willing to place a large bet with you about that. <laughs> Lunch, dinner? <laughs> Let me go okay, to not a large majority. <laughs> Let me go to something that both of you have touched on, and I think we really need to talk about. So, um, you know, talk about the first, uh, rather the Second Amendment. Um, that's really important to public security. It's important to keeping people, you know, off the streets and not doing violence because violence leads to and is part of the whole notion of insurrection, if you will. Um, and so the pre Supreme Court, you know, if they, um, you know, undermine uh, the regulation of guns, gun control, they're really asking for trouble. And that takes us to the next part of it is, you know, they are doing things that undermine our democracy when they don't enforce voting rights. Uh, when they take cases that are, you know, uh, you know, undermining voting rights, um, wouldn't that be sort of the most central thing that a Supreme Court of this country should be concerned with? The, you know, the the, the Ben Franklin preservation of our republic, our democracy, and public security, which is part of it. Uh, you know, it seems to me they're really tampering with something very dangerous when they take anti-democratic cases and rule anti-democratically. Well, I think you're right. Uh, and I think that that is a tradition to be valued and cherished and all this. It's a tradition, uh, as Peter 
Christopher pointed out, which was a pretty narrow tradition, right? So at the time of the early years of the Constitution, the framing in the early years, of course, women didn't get to vote, blacks didn't get, you had to be a property owner, and so on and so forth. So the vote has expanded, uh, not so much by Supreme Court decisions. The Supreme Court's been pretty bad about the vote all along. But maybe the worst example of all is a Roberts opinion, Shelby County. And the Voting Rights Act of 1965 is very significant. And a lot of blood was shed to get that passed. And I don't mean that year, I mean, for a long time, the civil rights movement. And what he says in that decision uh, in 2013 is, well, we needed it once, but we don't need it anymore. Now, since when does Congress have power only as long as it keeps up with current needs? I mean, that's a whole new doctrine. And then he relies on federalism, on states' rights. And he misparaphrases what the 10th Amendment says. He says in two different ways something it doesn't say. He says what he wants it to say. Now that's sloppy or it's planting seeds for the future. So the vote, very important, absolutely right about that and absolutely being limited by this court, including July 1st, uh, where Arizona uh, did two things to change its voting laws. One was to say, uh, you, you can't, uh, bundle rights, you can, uh, sorry, bundle ballots. Um, the reason that's important in Arizona is that a lot of Native Americans live far away from mailboxes. And so someone would bring in the ballots from a reservation as it were, and uh, that was said, oh, you can't do that anymore. So it has an impact, and you could say a racial ethnic impact, which should have mattered under the Voting Rights Act, but uh, not so much, says Alito. Voting is a burden anyway. And the other thing they did was say, if you vote in the wrong precinct, We'll throw it out. Now, they kept changing where the precincts were. Well, what do you know? Most places you vote in the wrong precinct, there's sort of a chance to you know, review where and so on. But no, we just throw them out. And he says, not a problem. You know that, so Shelby County said, you can still have vote section two of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, and he's now limiting that too. So not much concern for the vote. And I think correctly, as Jay just said, the vote is really supposed to be the base, right, from which other things flow. They also said bad things about campaign finance and so on, but for another for another day. For another day. But, you know, I just wonder, I'm trying to put myself in, in the Supreme Court building. I wonder if you have ever tried to do this, Abby, try to figure out, um, you know, how they conduct themselves there. And, and do they know they're gaslighting? Do they know they're they're throwing out norms. Do they know they're risking the republic? And do they, you know, do they write memos to each other about that? Do they talk about it over a cup of coffee, or do they, or do they not know at all and not even discuss it? I, I really wonder how it works in there. Do you have an idea? Well, it used to be that they talked among themselves a fair amount. Uh, then they sort of stopped doing that, but they did it through the clerks, you know. So. Frankfurter famously was very good about encouraging, you know, talking to them. And, and so Frankfurter's clerk would talk to Douglas's clerk and maybe they would, but now they have their own little offices sort of self-contained. And many of the clerks, there are too many clerks, some people believe, but many of the clerks uh, wind up, you know, getting a few paragraphs in opinion just so he'll or she will feel good. Uh, so that we get longer opinions, we get much less in the way of reaching a common result through discussion. I think it's a real problem. Yeah, and it shows. Uh, Peter, we're almost out of time, right. Peter. I wonder if you could comment on all of that and try to summarize you know, the, the prognostications that are inherent in this discussion. Uh, oh, right. uh, we'll try to do that in two and a half minutes. If uh, Jay's original question was really, uh, what is the Supreme Court and what it's worth for, if anything, I think Abby has given us a very, uh, pragmatic approach. There are problems. Uh, he seems uh, somewhat optimistic, though, that those problems uh, might not be uh, a nuclear option for the court. Uh, we still have uh, decisions awaiting, right, the abortion and the gun control decisions. And so I think uh, Avi has suggested to us that we need to pay some attention to how those decisions are made, not just the end results. And that gets back into you know Jay's broader question about the transparency of a democracy. How, you know, as Toby Ziegler said in West Wing, you don't want to see how a sausage is being made. And in this case, Justice Breyer agreed. Uh, he had an interview a couple weeks ago about his book, 
and he is uh, thumbs down on transparency. So we're sort of left with uh, obvious optimism and Breyer's inability for us to actually confirm that optimism. So in a way, we're back to where we started this show, Jay, which is, do we have faith in the institution? In other words, can I believe in the Supreme Court, like I believe in my car will work without knowing how the battery actually operates? Peter, yeah. your car works? Wait uh, a minute. Barely, barely. I'm not, I'm not quite sure we have. I'm that a little is bit another bit. show. Yeah. Right. Of all but, the things Avi said, though, I think what was most um, perceptive and disturbing is that the Supreme Court is unlike anything else. There's too much information out there, too many websites, too many people who think that they're experts. So in other words, you go to your website already with the view about the court, and you don't really have what Jonathan Rock would call a constitution of knowledge, which is a book I recommend. That the constitution... Yeah, one, sorry. one more bit of optimism in a way. Okay. So as bad as this court is, and I certainly <laughs> agree with that, Trump struck out over and over again in both state and federal court systems, including the United States Supreme Court, when he tried, what, 60 times? Uh, so there is still some respectable something there. Uh, my, my, dear, my dear friend, my dear friend, uh, you and Jay both give Trump too much credit. I'm not giving Trump credit. No, I'm giving the in other words, credit. It, well, no, in other words, they don't really care about that. They, they don't care about Trump. Uh, they, they have, I mean, in the 50 years of the federal society, Trump is, is just like with the evangelicals. He is a vessel of God. Well, he is the agent for- Oh my God, this is, a, this is, this is a, you know, a family show, Peter. Uh, so let me let me just put one more question to you guys, both of you, before we close. And is, um, you know, we do have three. Last time I looked, we had three branches of government. Do you have more confidence in the Supreme Court or more confidence in the United States Senate? Which one trumps? Uh, the NBA commissioner. I have more confidence in the NBA commissioner. <laughs> yeah. So. For all that we've said, the Supreme Court, unlike most people in Washington or most people, I guess, in government more generally, uh, they put things in writing. They put it out there. They don't just give you the results. So at least that keeps those of us who do constitutional law uh, with material to talk about, new things to teach about. But it also, there is some responsibility in that and actually some transparency. It's not to say that they're actually saying what their gut might have led them to say, but they try to explain. And then we all get to say, wait a minute, that's not the way it works. That's not what that precedent said. But you're absolutely right. You know, our newspaper, among many others, has this kind of daily quiz, our star advertiser. And, you know, what did you think of such and such? There's not even a pretense that anyone read the opinion, right? Just what did you think of it? And so we're very result oriented and uh, it is a problem. I'm going to give you so which one point. do you have more confidence in? I have, I have more confidence in the executive branch because I, I didn't executive. ask that. Uh, yes, you did. That's one of the small branches, a little twig, because, and this will, will probably date me and my father, the federal uh, executive branch is a bureaucracy. And historically, bureaucracies, as we even know during the Trump administration, were able to stop things from happening which were overly radical. And that's, that's a, a lesson from Max Weber, and that's a lesson from history. Uh, don't pay attention to the appointees. Pay attention to the lower members of the bureaucracy. When people get upset, they'll say they're not elected, uh, but quite often they are the experts who have an institutional memory and actually have a much better respect for the public interest. The public doesn't have much respect for the public interest. The bureaucracy has respect for the public interest. So I'm going with the executive branch and I'm gonna say something even more surprising that uh, the current head of that executive branch is quietly getting some things done. He's gonna lose on the big issues, but he's quietly actually gotten some very important things done uh, because of the ability to use that bureaucracy. So I'll, I'll give you a slightly different answer. I'm very disappointed in the legislative branch. That's when I used to work in. I think that there's a real problem there. I, I'm a little worried that the Senate is actually broken, which would be a topic for another, another discussion. But I'm, I'm very worried about that. 
All true, but Avi gets the last word. Of course. Since when? <laughs> 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 so some of Peter's optimism about uh, civil service has to do with his studying England uh, and career uh, civil servants who really are seeing themselves as civil servants. Uh, but I think there is much to what Peter says, and it isn't just federal. Uh, people did their jobs, often under pressure. And that is why we know that it was a big lie, right? Because there were people who were on the spot, and a lot of them were Republicans. And so there is something to be said for doing your job. And that gets back to constitutional faith, I think, for all the problems we've been talking about. There, there is faith in this system for all its warts, its flaws, its crevices. So let's keep at it. That's right. Constitutional law and constitutional history has never been so interesting and important. Uh, thank you, Avi Seufer. Uh, thank, thank you, you Peter Hoffenberg. Yeah, Great course. discussion. We'll do it again, I promise. So much more to cover. Aloha. Absolutely. Thank you, Aloha.